Deuteronomy chapter 28, please. Make your way over, if you would, Old Testament. What's happening in the book of Deuteronomy is 400 years, they've been in slavery there in Egypt. You know that story. And then 40 years, they're in the desert. And God was feeding them supernaturally with manna that was growing on the ground. 40 years. Never had to go to Walmart. The Bible says that uh, their shoes never wore out. Their clothing never wore out. And the batteries in their Game Boys never, ever ran out. God provided that beautiful Shekinah glory. Do you remember that? And the Bible says it was a column of cloud, of supernatural glory. But not only column, it spread out over the top a like kind of a parasol. So it shaded them from the searing heat of that part of the country. And then at night, what does it turn into? It turned into a column of fire. Can you imagine? You know, does God exist, Papa? And then you bring your little one to the tent flap of your house and you point to the house of God in the tabernacle. And there was the column of fire. You bet, son. And there he is. Forty years that had happened there in the desert. And now in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they are about to enter into the promised land. Funny thing about that, uh, when you come through your trial and your tribulation, um, praise God, way to go. You stuck it out. You hung in there. Careful harvest of the other trial, the trial of prosperity, the trial of blessing. They're going to go into the promised land, and as you well know, God is going to bless them there in a tremendous fashion. So right before they go, if you know where they're at, they're right across the Jordan. The Jordan, the Bible says in the book of Joshua, is at flood stage, which in those days, and there's pictures even today of the Jordan River in this region, where the Jordan River had overflowed its bank and was about a mile across. Pretty amazing. How are we going to get across that? The Lord, you tell them, Mo, didn't I get you through the Red Sea okay? I'm going to get you through this Jordan River as well. Another interesting detail is as they were standing there, they could look across the river and they could see Jericho. Here we go into the land of flowing with milk and honey, or soon to be. Chapter 28, please, verse 1. Now when you go there, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. It shall come to pass that if you, Israel, diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God... And observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command to you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Verse 2. And all these blessings will come upon you and, what's your next word? Overtake you. You can't outrun them either. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body. This is your children. Once again, we have to go through the emotional meat grinder of somebody going into one of our schools and killing students and teachers. I don't know about you, but it is so hard Wednesday, September the 4th, Appalachia High School, Winter, pardon me, Winder, Georgia, two students and two teachers were killed, nine wounded. And once again, our country grieves. Our nation is outraged and deeply frustrated and divided. And in spite of all of our economic prowess and strength, our military might, all of our academic and political experts we cannot seem to be able to protect our children. How many of you have sensed it? It's like a frustration that's almost indescribable. What do we do? Did you know that Israel experienced the same thing? We're going we're gonna to go to three verses. We're going to finish up here in Deuteronomy quickly. I'm then going to take you to Isaiah chapter 5. And then we'll spend the balance of our time in the Old Testament book of Hosea chapter 9. Isaiah and Hosea were roughly contemporaries. They prophesied about the same time. Call it 700 B.C. 
And did you know that Israel at one time had experienced generations of tremendous prosperity? Solomon, their great king, was so wise. The Bible says that gold was so plentiful that people looked at silver like, ew, you know, rocks on the side of the road. Their military was unstoppable. Their rich economic and political influence had stretched to such a degree that there were people coming into Israel. What are you doing? How are you pulling this off, Solomon? Queen of Sheba, wow, you know. What are you doing? How are you pulling this off? You know why Israel was so prosperous? Deuteronomy 28. They had founded their nation just before they crossed over the Jordan, before Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and following. And then by the time you get to King Solomon, King David, of course, was a tremendous king. He was a man after God's own heart. And then he hands the keys off to Solomon. And Solomon, they were so prosperous. He built his own house that was beyond description. And then he built the house of God. He took the humble tabernacle that Moses was instructed to build. And he quadruples all of the proportions. And now it's one of the, one of the true glimmering with gold one of the true um, miracles of the ancient world. And then Solomon dies, and then here we go. By the time you get to about 700 B.C., um, Solomon is about three or four generations removed, and now they're falling into problems. And that's where we're going to pick up our story here in a second. I'm giving you the backdrop of why they were so, so blessed and it began to get into their notion and thinking, check out how awesome we are. We have the gross national product of all the world. Our military is unstoppable. No one would even think of coming against Jerusalem, the golden city, and on their money, in God we trust. And ain't nobody getting in here. But then... Soon, because of their idolatry and turning away from the Lord, as we'll see here in a minute, they're going to go against Deuteronomy 28. And when they do, what does God do? Well, let me show you. Uh, real quickly again, verse 2, before they get into the promised land, this is uh, roughly 1400 B.C. Joshua is just about ready to take over. Verse 2, Deuteronomy 28. Now all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed in the city, and blessed, blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, your children. I, said the Lord, I'm going to supernaturally protect you, your cities, and your children. The produce of the ground and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks, Verse 5, blessed shall be your baskets and your kneading bowl. Read that. Your Walmarts will always be fully stocked and everything on sale. Verse 6, blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. What a, if you know that verse, if we sort of were to unpack that a little bit, you've worked um, a goodly day's work, but you're seeing the fruit of your labor and it's pouring back. Blessing, just like was promised. This is a notion of I come in from the field. My field is doing well. I eat a healthy, wholesome uh, meal with all my family. I'm providing for them. I'm going to pull those covers up that night to my chin and drift off to sleep with full security that when I wake up tomorrow, all things will be intact. That sense of peace that we're on the right track and God is supernaturally Protecting us. That's what it means. You're going in and then you're going out. Verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you and before your face. They shall come out against you one way, but flee seven ways. They come in a very raucous and formidable foe. Oh man, what are we going to do? You fast and you pray and you ask God to show up. And what happens is God shows up. And har, har, they came in one way, and then they scatter seven. Verse 8, and the Lord will command the blessing on your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. 
The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has shown to you if you keep his command, pardon me, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Now watch this. And then all the other people around you, they're going to see you. That you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body. There's your kids again. In the increase of your livestock and in the produce of the ground and the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. It's truly going to flow with milk and honey. You're going to be so inventive that you're going to invent all kinds of stuff, have patents on all kinds of things, and everybody's going to go, man, what is it with you? You seem to be an exceptional nation of innovative and creative people. Harvest, does that sound familiar to you? There are two nations that I'm aware of that were deliberately founded on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One, obviously, would be the Jewish people. Can you think of another one? If you know the story of your pilgrims, if you know the story of the, of the um, uh, Boston, oh gosh, come on, brain, um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Puritans today get a bad rap, and then in your mind, you're thinking of a prudish bunch of people with a big buckle in their hat. Um, if you know more about that society, oh, this was a nation harvest that was deliberately founded on the God of the Bible. Many people don't know that when the Articles of Confederation weren't working out particularly well, well, first of all, before that, how improbable were 13 colonies with squirrel guns over their fireplaces able to throw off the greatest seafaring empire on the planet at the time? How was that even possible? You need to read the, um, see if you just read that in a history book one where. Well, some, but you know where I get most of my information from? The actual documents of the actual founding fathers, and I encourage you to do the same. Wallbuilders.org, or could be .com, but Wallbuilders has more than 100,000 original documents from the period of our founding fathers. Original. Did you know that... Um, John Adams, who is our second president, our first vice president, he was in the first Continental Congress, which drafted the Declaration of Independence. We have a document, a copy of it, right out here in our hallway. If you get a chance, look it through. Do you know the 20-some articles of why we have a biblical mandate to come out from under oppression, political oppression, was because we were being oppressed also religiously as well. And the 20-some articles were preached in the pulpits of New England 30 years before the founding fathers, many of them, took up arms. You need to know that. John Adams, the first vice president and the first, second president of the United States, he was at the first Continental Congress, which drafted Thomas Jefferson et al., the Declaration of Independence. He was in the Second Continental Congress. And the, he was in the, the um, U.S. Constitutional Congress as well. When the articles weren't working. And they fasted and they prayed. If you don't know the story, you really should. And did you know that John Adams wrote his wife Abigail practically every other day? And many of those letters still stand. And we have a practical minutes of the meetings of the First Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress, the Constitutional Congress, etc. And the fact that we have a bicameral Senate and House, an executive branch, a judicial branch, nobody had ever thought about such radical political science. How did our guys come up with that? Because they're like exceptional people. They were brilliant academics to be sure. But did you know that over 20 of the founding, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 29, I believe, had advanced theological degrees? Did you know that? This nation of America was founded on the God of Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. If you'll allow me just a little further, when they ratified the Constitution, if you know the story, it ratified very quickly. And then because of that, we need, a, we need an executive branch. And so George Washington was elected practically unanimous as our very first president. Did you know that the day of his inauguration, he held his hand out on a what, everybody? A Bible. And around him were, again, many of the people, the, the uh, John Jay, uh, the first U.S. First, first um, come on, brain, you can do this. He was the first, <laughs> my brain, he was the first Supreme Court Justice, the honcho justice guy in the Supreme Court, Chief Justice. Thank you. It just came to me from over here somewhere. <laughs> He's standing there. You need to know that when he got done with his swearing in, you need to read what he wrote, his speech and they come down Freedom Hall, they, uh, they, they did the ceremony on the Portacashire, the second floor, and then they come down Federal Hall, and they go down Wall Street, and then they hang a right on Broadway. Right there on the corner was Trinity Church, still being repaired after the British had bombarded. He hung a right on Broadway, and then they turn into a little chapel there called St. Paul's Chapel. If you didn't know this story, you need to know it. And in St. Paul's Chapel, St. Paul's Chapel, then they heard a sermon for an hour and a half, and then they prayed for another hour and a half. The entire executive, judicial, and legislative branch of this brand new constitutional governmental system, this republic, all of them went to church and they prayed. Oh, God, lead us. Again, if you'll indulge me just a moment, fast forward the film to 9-11. Do you remember the two towers? Do you know there were seven buildings in that whole complex right there, the Twin Towers? At the time when they were built, completed in the early 70s, they were the tallest structures on the planet. That World Trade Center, there were seven buildings. And what was that all about? America after World War II. Man, we were so economically powerful. We're the bomb. And then they brought the whole, whole um, post-World War II financial center there to New York. On 9-11, when those planes destroyed those two buildings, as you know, there was rubble falling from a height of over 1,300 feet. All seven of the buildings in the World Trade Center were eventually destroyed. 800 feet from the North Tower was St. Paul's Chapel. There was a sycamore tree. A girder had fallen and sailed away and would have crushed little St. Paul's Chapel, but that sycamore tree caught it. And the very same chapel that George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, all the people, most of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were in St. Paul's Chapel all those years ago asking, begging God to please, please God, guard, guide, and govern this new nation. And on 9-11, St. Paul's Chapel, not one window was cracked. All seven buildings of America puffing out its chest. We are so the bomb. All of those were destroyed. Was God trying to tell us something, Harvest? There are two nations I'm aware of that were founded specifically on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel is one of them, and the other one is America. I'm heavy-hearted today, as many of you are. Again, another school shooting. And this is why I want to go over this today. I want to give you the backdrop. Why was Israel so blessed? Well, here's why. We're verse 12 now. Verse 12, Deuteronomy 28. Then the Lord will open up to you as good treasure, the heavens to give you rain and your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. No matter what climactic mechanism is at work, 
the lack of rain, which is to say the lack of water for crops, which will eventually drive the entire economy, that's a God thing. Global warming may be the mechanism, but rest assured, the reason that that's even allowed too is because God is still trying to get the attention of this planet. You shall lend to many nations and you shall not borrow. Whoo! I looked it up this morning in case you were curious. Did you know that as of this morning, you owe $147,000 every single one of you? The national debt this morning was $35 trillion. Now, gross national product, goods and services that we produce, including your job and whatever it might be, America sort of makes on its job, if you will, $25.44 trillion, yet we're spending $15 trillion over that every single year. What happens in your family if you spend more than you bring in? Uh, was it once said, I heard an economist once say, it'll be a moving experience. Meaning you got to move out of your house because you got foreclosed on. Is it wisdom to spend more than you make? What's happening? let you know the, the policy. It's this harvest. Did you know that America used to be the greatest creditor nation in the world up until the mid-60s? Now, who is the greatest debtor nation on the planet? We are. Verse 13, And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and not beneath. If, you might want to circle that, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you, shall, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I have commanded you this day. And remember, they're standing across from Jericho. They're like, you bet, Lord, we're so with you. And they all had their letterman's jacket on, J for Jehovah. They were all in. To do the, not to go to the right or to the left, and do not go after other gods to serve them. Now verse 15. But if, you sh if it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all of these, what? Curses will come upon you and they will overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall, you be, shall be your basket and kneading bowl, verse 18. And cursed shall be the fruit of your body. Who is that? Your kids. Your kids. Hold your finger, or don't hold your finger. Now I want to take you, would you join me now in the book of Isaiah? Isaiah, about 700 B.C., um, Isaiah, the Lord has told Isaiah, the people of Israel, Isaiah 5, please. The people of Israel are believing their, their press. They are indeed a blessed nation. Reaching its zenith apex, probably under King Solomon, nobody could tell them nothing. And they begin to use their great wealth to exploit others. And there's all kinds of travesty going on. We are now in chapter 5, Isaiah. We are approximately 600-ish years from the shores of the Jordan River. Chapter 5. People ask me sometimes, hey, Pastor Steve, do you ever see America in the Bible? You know, there's a couple of cool places. But Isaiah chapter 5 is about as America as I can see. Are you ready? Chapter 5, verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. Now he's speaking of Israel. Interest of time. Um, verse 5. And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. Why? I'll show you. I'm going to take away the hedge. What's a hedge? It's a hedge of protection. Because remember in Deuteronomy 28 he said I would supernaturally protect you. But they're not doing it anymore. So he has to do what he has to do. And it shall be burned, speaking of Jerusalem, and breaking down its wall, and it shall be trampled down, and I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and, and thorns, 
and I will command the clouds that the rain that that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord, verse seven, the ho- the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now, verse number eight, please. There are seven woes that are that are um, pronounced on Israel. I don't know about you. I think I see America here. Just what do you think? We're in chapter five, verse eight. Woe to those who join house to house and add field to field until there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Real estate speculation. People are getting rich on buying home after home. And have you heard about in Reno Sparks, there's a housing crunch. And did you know that a big part of that is because there are people that have money and they're buying up several homes and they're using them as, as Airbnb type things. Um, in uh, South Lake Tahoe and in, um, and in Truckee, it's become a crisis. That the actual, and in Reno Sparks, that a single income police officer, fire department officer, nurses cannot afford to live in this town. And can a community survive without people uh, working the restaurants and the hospitals and patrolling the streets? That is a symptom harvest. It is a symptom that was true of the people of Israel, and I believe it's a symptom here. This is runaway materialism. Verse 11, please. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. That's not just getting up early to get drunk, although that's a part of it. This is is pursuing. um, Do you guys know that the word muse, M-U-S-E, means deep introspective thought and consideration? To muse on something, to stroke the beard, so to speak. Mm, Let me think about that. Let me do some research. Research. You know, you put an A in front of that, it means exactly the opposite. Ah, amusement is the opposite of muse. You tell me what most people are plugged into almost all of the time. Their phones. Sometimes it's gaming, but you know what's really getting a hold of a whole lot of people now? Is it's, uh, what is it, the um, YouTube, Instagram, Or you can watch 25, 15, 20, 25 seconds of whatever. Kitty cats, doggies, how to make brownies. And what else? Violence. Have you noticed that people cannot stand in the line at a store without being drawn into the screen of their phone? That harvest is amusement. And our society is swallowed up in that. Look at this. Here it is. Amusement. Verse 13, please. Therefore, my people have gone into captivity. In my opinion, that's not just here. It's going to be Assyrians, the northern ten tribes. But I believe that many of our culture are locked into their screens. And they can't live an hour without their phone. They're honorable men, pardon me, because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished. Where are the brilliant men to lead the society? They're off distracted. And their multitude is dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol has enlarged itself. Verse number 18, please. Your, your, your wise men are not going to be, they may have high IQs, but they have low wisdom. Verse 18, what are those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity? This is sin on display. And I was telling Wednesday night crowd, the gay pride that's coming in a few weeks to America, and in many communities, you know about this, they will literally have floats on the main street of their city. And on the float will be the gay pride people, and many of them scantily clad, and many of them actually doing or faking or imitating sexual acts on the float as it is drawn through town. Look what they say. 
They draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if it were a cart afloat. Verse 19, they say, let him, capital H, that's God. Where is God? See, there is no God. Let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. They're doing these simulated sexual acts, often same gender, on Main Street, effectively saying, there is no God. Would he let us get away with this if there was? Verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Have we seen that harvest? Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Have you seen it on social media? People who believe with every fiber of their being how intelligent and advanced they are. And their policies are, I almost said a really rough word. Let me, Lord, give me another word from the Rolodex, please. A man identifying as a woman standing on the top podium of a college swimming or track event because he beat a bunch of women. One senator was asked specifically, can you define, it's not even a senator, it was a, it was a U.S. Supreme Court justice candidate. Can you please give me the definition of what a woman is? And this person hemmed and hawed, no. Wise in their own eyes, Prudent in their own sight. Verse 22. Woe to the men at mighty at drinking wine. Woe to the men valiant at mixing intoxicating drink. Verse 23. Who justify the wicked for a bribe. This is a perversion of the justice system. Please notice that Isaiah chapter 5 is the other side of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And now all of this, and I sort of don't want to even go past that anymore, but I do want to draw your attention please to verse 25. Verse 25, therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. Remember, in God we trust. These were the people that saw the manna in the morning. These were the people who saw the Shekinah glory at night. These were the people who saw God part the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Did you know when they show up to the, to the outside of the walls of Jericho and remember the two spies that are sent in and they run into Rahab, do you remember that? And they, and they say, well, what's going on? And Rahab says, Jericho is terrified of you people. He's all, really? We heard about God parting the Red Sea. That was 40 years ago in Rahab's time. How famous has God been on the behalf of Israel. And look how far she's fallen. He has stretched out his hand against them. He has stricken them and the hills trembled. Their carcasses are as refuse in the midst of the streets. Why is that? Because remember God said, if you obey me, I'm gonna make sure that there will be, never be any conquering armies ever. But if you don't, I'm gonna pull my hedge away. And they're going to come in seven ways, scattered marauders, really. And Israel at the time was one of the great military mights of the world. Harvest in 9-11, all those years ago, who had the greatest military in the whole world? How many aircraft carriers do we have? How many active personnel? We have the satellite system. We have the geosynchronous whatever. We are so mighty. And yet through the gates of the nation, I think New York serves nicely as a model for the gates of America for a number of reasons. Yet through the gates of America, a small band of marauders killed 3,000 Americans. How is it possible? You need to read Isaiah chapters 9 and 10, especially chapter 10, verse 9. How did this happen? And the people of Israel, no big deal. We had sycamore trees, but we're going to plant evergreens, baby. We're going to rebuild this time not with mud bricks, but with carved stone. Mm. 
And you remember after the towers fell, it took them, what, almost a year, more than a year to clear all the debris? And do you remember when they laid the stone, that New Jersey stone, the foundation of the, of the um, Freedom Tower that is there now? And there was a big hoopla, and somebody cited Isaiah. The bricks have fallen, the two towers, and we will build with stone. He didn't read the rest of the verse. What they should have done when that little band of marauders had made their way into the land of Israel, fighting force unmatched. They should have repented and asked God for forgiveness. But Israel did not. They puffed their chest out even wider and here they are. Look at the end of verse 25. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but, I hope you have a highlighter harvest, but his anger hand is stretched out still. Would you write two verses here? Would you write Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30? Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30. And then also write Jeremiah 5 verse 1. Ezekiel taken captive in Babylon, God says, I want you to go around the whole city and see if you can find one person broken for the sin of Israel. God says, I looked. I looked and I looked and I looked for one person, just one who would be broken for the sin of Israel. To stand in the gap, to intercede for this nation, and I would have relented my, ju my judgment. But I found, do you remember Harvest? None. At the same time there in Jerusalem, God says to Jeremiah, search, go up and down all the streets, all the rooftops, find me one, find me just one. And Jeremiah couldn't find one either. The exiled there in Babylon at the same time, the remnant there in Jerusalem, and the people of God had come so far from Deuteronomy 28 that there wasn't one man or woman broken for the sin I've just read you in Isaiah chapter 5. And so God says, they wouldn't believe me. I sent them off. Little flutter. Tried to be nice. And they wouldn't receive it. So I had to send the lion. And now finally, would you join me please in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 9, please. Go to Daniel and hang a right. It's the, next, it's the next prophet. Hosea is a contemporary, roughly about the same time as Isaiah. You know the story about Hosea, right? God says, hey, Hosea, would you minister and be my prophet? You bet, Lord. What would you want me to do? Okay, Hosea... You are going to fall in love with a beautiful woman. He's all, I like where this is going. But do you know the story? She was a harlot. And even after Hosea marries her and is deeply in love, and his only desire is to watch over her and protect her and provide for her, she did not have to work the streets anymore, but she wanted to. And Hosea was supposed to be a representative in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. And people, hey, Hosea, you know, have you seen what his wife's been doing? <laughs> and he doesn't even divorce her. <laughs> what a loser. And Hosea was what? A model. Because Israel was playing the harlot of idolatry. And God loved her desperately and would not write her a certificate of divorce. That's a model. Now you're in uh, Hosea chapter 9. And Chris, are you ready for this? One more church shooting. Sorry for this painful memory harvest, but I think it's important. 
May 24th, 2022, Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas, 19 students killed, two teachers, 17 wounded. Santa Fe High School, May 18th, 2018, eight students, two teachers killed, 13 wounded. February 14th, 2018, Marjorie Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, 17 children killed, 15 injured. Sandy Hook Elementary School, Newton, Connecticut, December of 2012, 28 first graders killed, two wounded. Columbine High School, it's been a while, but Columbine High School, Colorado, April the 20th, 1999, 15 students killed, 24 wounded. Harvest, do you know that this breaks God's heart too? Isaiah chapters 25 and 26, if you get a chance, cruise through. That's where the Lord shows you his heart. He is broken. Remember, if you, the Bible says, being evil, know how to love your kids, how much more your heavenly father. And you have to understand what's going on here. When God says, I tried and I tried and I tried to send you the moth, but you won't listen. I have to bring the lion. And in fact, if you're in chapter 9 of Hosea, would you write next to verse 1, chapter 5, verses 10 through 14. That's where God's weeping heart says, I tried and I tried and I tried to tell them. They wouldn't listen to the moth, so I had to bring the lion and harvest what is the greatest treasure of any city or any community? The children. And God says, if I have to resort to that, and it's this shepherd's job, I believe, to bring it to the forefront, then that nation is in big trouble. Ready, Chris? These are five warning signs for America. And it's here in Hosea. Why can't we protect our children? It's happened before. And right in Hosea and some other locations, they shake their fist at God and government. What's going on? Aren't you watching God? Ooh, those politicians. And God is saying, this is not a political problem. This is a spiritual one. Are you in chapter 9? Look at verse 1. Do not rejoice, O Israel. This is about the same time as Isaiah. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples. For you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. They've had sex. Salacious, sometimes paid for sex. Where? Everywhere. The threshing floor was a very communal, community place. And if you're doing the nasty stuff in front of everybody, is that a brazen society or what? That's what they're doing. On every threshing floor, verse 2, the threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them now, and the new wine shall fail her. They are so consumed with sex and sexuality that they were even going to temple, remember, at that time, and they couldn't wait to get out of church to get back to their sin. Sign, first warning, number one. Go ahead, Chris. The first warning sign that a nation is pulling away from God. They may be attending church, but most of their time, resources, and passions are spent on sin. Gambling, addictions, that is a symptom harvest. And even when going regularly to church, some of these people go to church a lot. But even as they're sitting there listening to the pastor, they're replaying the video that they viewed over and over just the night before. Verse 3. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim, the northern ten tribes region, they're going to return to Egypt. Really, that means slavery because the Assyrians are going to come and get them. 
and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. That happened. This is the second warning sign. Go is the returning to the things that God saved me from. Why did God save them out of Egypt? Because Egypt was awful. It's a model of the world even today. We were out of slavery. And remember, what did Pharaoh demand of the Jewish midwives if a child was born a man? Kill it. Did Israel, could Israel in Egypt protect their kids even there? And then they've been freed. And now they're going back. Second warning sign. Returning to the things that God has saved me from. Verse 4. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like the bread of mourners. Um, in Numbers chapter 19, Israel is instructed, don't, if you touch a dead body, anything that you touch will be, um, will be defiled. So these people were bringing offerings to the Lord, and many of them had literally touched dead things and still brought stuff to church. And God says, and it doesn't even bother them. It shall be like the bread of mourners at a funeral, to them, and all who eat it shall be defiled. That's Numbers 19. For their, for their bread shall be for their own life, and it shall not come into the house of the Lord. They're spending all their stuff on themselves, and stuff they're supposed to be dedicating to a holy God. Who cares? No big deal. I give God the leftovers, not the first fruits. And we'll even go so far as to touch a dead body or a, a dead animal or something that God says don't do it, and they do it anyway. Oh, nobody will know. This is warning sign number three. Go. That non-godly stuff seems alive while God's true word and worship seems dead. Who would bring a defiled piece of anything to church in this setting? It's someone who doesn't care about the holiness of God. Harvest, please never forget, church is not for me. It's for him. And do we check our hearts before we get here? Third warning sign, non-godly stuff seems alive. Let's more fun. While God's true word and worship seems dead. Paul said it in the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine. Endure. I endure the dentist. But sound doctrine, um, I heard recently from a, uh, a um, seminary student, he was taking a course in what's called homiletics, which is preaching. And one of the things that instructor pounded in their head, don't go more than 20 minutes because nobody wants to see a boring talking head, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, Harvest, you got to endure this mug on average an hour each time. But any time you ever come to Harvest Family Fellowship for anything, God's word will always be central. But have you ever noticed those aren't the big churches? Because people, they're no fun. Pastor, tell us, fill us up, Lord, with the fast food of topics, etc., etc. That's not what God says. When a person or nation strays because of sin or rebellion, they get excited about events and talented people and shiny baubles that are not eternal. And then the humans may get pumped, but they accomplish little for the real kingdom. We're almost done. Verse five. What will you do, says Hosea to the people of God who are in violation of Deuteronomy 28 and they are symptomatically described in Isaiah five? What will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the fast of the Lord? The previous section was day-to-day -day life. Now we're going to talk about the big holidays. Passover, Pentecost, Shavuot, etc. What about those? Verse 6. For indeed they, the true elements of those big days, they're gone because of destruction. I'm going to destroy your temple. What? Unconscionable. No way. Egypt, really the world, or bondage, shall gather them up. And then Memphis, Tennessee is mentioned in the Bible right here. No, Memphis, Tennessee was named after this Memphis. This is in Egypt. And it was a burial center. Burial 
Center, about 20 miles south of modern-day Cairo. They're, they shall bury them. And meanwhile, back home, nettles shall possess their valuables of silver. Thorns shall be in their tents. All that hard work is going to go away when I let the Syrians take over the northern ten tribes. The southern two tribes were in the crosshairs of God's judgment too. Do you know why it didn't happen? Do you know the story about the Assyrians camped around Jerusalem? Do you know that story? And you remember that the good king, Hezekiah, what are we supposed to do? Isaiah says you're supposed to fast and pray, and he did. Do you remember the story that the angel walked around this vast army outside the walls, and then the next day 186,000 woke up dead? Do you remember that story? And all the Assyrians went, whoa, and they left. And a couple generations after good king Hezekiah, there was an eight-year-old boy on the throne of Israel. And by the time he is 18, 19, 20 years of age, he loves God. He loved God so much. He comes from a very dysfunctional family. His grandfather and father were awful. They actually had worship booths inside uh, the temple of Solomon, if you know the story. What do you mean worship booths? Harlots because they were getting back into calf worship. Hey, how'd that calf worship thing work the first time? And you could literally pay or a priestess or a priest of Baal et al. And you would have sex for hire inside the temple of God. That's how bad it got. Josiah comes to the throne at age eight. And by the time he's 18, 19 years of age, he says, I'm gonna turn it around. Hey, there's hope for all of us who come from a dysfunctional family, amen? He turned it around. He said, we're gonna redo everything. 57 years my father and grandfather wrecked and ravaged this holy place. And while they're doing that thing, uh, renovation, a Bible falls out of the wall hall. And they all look at it like a calf looks at a new gate. What is that? They bring it to the young king and he reads it and he gets to Deuteronomy 28. He goes, oh, my. And he weeps and he tears his clothes. Oh, God, he says, what sin has our nation been involved with? And God sends him a prophetess. Mm. I saw that, Josiah. I saw your heart, remember? Just one, just one. I saw that, Josiah. And because of your brokenness for the sin of this nation, I will stay my hand of judgment for the entire generation that you live. And when you live, that's when I'll bring the Babylonians. The northern ten tribes, they're taken off in fish hooks by the Assyrians. Roughly about 140 years later, then the southern two tribes of Judah are taken over by the Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple. But before the Babylonians, God stayed his hand of judgment because of one teenager whose heart was broken for the sin of his nation. Did you hear that harvest? Why? Because God's hand is outstretched still. Almost done. Verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come, Israel. You're done. The northern ten tribes, the Assyrians, are probably about 15 years away. The days, verse 7, of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. Here's what they say. The prophet is a fool. And the spiritual man is insane. The real prophets, nobody wants to hear them. The false prophets, if you do a study in the book of Isaiah, they're getting paid. They're hugely popular. And their central message of false prophecy is this. Go back to sleep, people of God. Peace and prosperity. Have you heard any teaching in the church about that? They were false prophets. And they say to the real prophets, you're a fool. 
Jeremiah, ask him. They threw him in the... Um, in a pit, and that's not a barbecue pit where they threw him in. And the spiritual man is crazy because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. Fourth warning sign, go. Loss of spiritual discernment. People are going to church in record numbers, but they won't listen to the true prophets. Please give me something that I like to hear. And isn't that also a prophecy? Yeah, in the last days they will heap up to themselves teachers, telling them what they're what? Itching ears want to hear. Finally, verse 8. And watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fowler's snare in all of his ways. Enmity in the house of God. False prophets will abound. Go back to sleep, family of God. Son and daughter of the Most High. You're okay. You're fine in your sin. I gave you some Bible verses to tell you that. And the real prophet. Most people don't want to go to a church that is teaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Verse 9, they are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. That's Judges 19 where the whole city of Gibeah was so taken over by homosexuality that a prophet brings his girlfriend to the Motel 6. She is a, she is a non-Jewish person. Are Levites supposed to be you know, marrying non-Jewish women? No. He brings his girlfriend, and Gibeah is so overtaken with sexual sin, they're pounding on the door. We want to have sex with you, this man of God. And you know what he does? He opens the door and shoves her out and closes the door. And they're so angry, they murder her savagely. And then he's all, oh, that's terrible. He cuts her body into 12 pieces. And then... Amazon primes them to the 12 tribes and all the people of Israel. Oh, this is terrible. He's a false prophet. That's how bad the leadership was in Israel at that time. That the prophet of God has a girlfriend in a Motel 6. That is so whacked out. Their, their priests and prophets are so far gone. Verse 10. I will found, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Very rare and precious. I saw your fathers as first fruits of the fig tree in its season and uh, anxiously anticipated. But they were, they went to Baal Peor. That's, a, that's the old thing of uh, Phinehas, if you know the story. Uh, Phinehas, the, the men of Israel were marrying non-Jewish women and nobody was saying nothing about it. And there was a great plague that breaks out. And then Phinehas takes a spear, you know, and he whips open a tent flap of a Jewish guy who took another Midianite wife, brrr, and he stabs him through shish kebab style. It's not very seeker friendly there, Mr. Phinehas. But the plague stopped. That's what that's in reference. Verse 11. And we'll end pretty much with this, down to verse 13. And as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. What? Is this God supernaturally closing the womb? Or is it in times of great harshness, people don't have babies? Maybe it's a combination of the two. Verse 12. And the, by the way, you know what the least birth rate in America, what generation is the least birth rate? This one. And the one right in front of you has fallen off sharply. Verse 12. And though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. Verse 13, just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, so Ephraim, and here it comes. Ephraim will bring out his children to the murderer. This is horrible. Why? Because in Israel's case, they would not listen to the moth. I had to send the lion. And you need to know that that breaks God's heart terribly. He is not pleased with the goings on of these events. And please understand that children who are killed under the age of accountability, they're going to be immediately with the Lord. And for you moms, I know that's a rough one, but you can't conceptualize them as little because they're not little now. They're fully formed in the presence of the Lord. But please notice, this is the last and final one. Number five, the fifth and I believe final warning sign to America, it was to, Is it was to Israel. They cannot protect their most treasured prize, their own children, because God's protective hedge is being removed. 
The Assyrians will murder men, women, and children. In chapter 10 of Hosea, the horror of those children murdered. Do you know the Bible reports on the real human condition? Doesn't candy coat it. Chapter 11, God's deeply, deeply broken heart because of it. Chapter 14, God's passionate plea for Israel to repent, and they did not. Let's all stand together. I'm sorry, Harvest, if this was a pointed and poignant message this morning. But like many of you, when you heard about the shooting this last week, and of course the details are coming out more and more, and have you noticed pe people shaking their fist at government and God? Please understand that this has happened before. It happened to Israel, and I believe because the other nation founded on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we also will not listen to the moth. And a broken-hearted God says, I'm going to have to bring the lion. If my people, who are called according to my purpose, would just humble themselves and pray, turn from their sin, seek my face, I would hear from heaven. I would heal them. I would forgive them of their sin, and I would heal their land. In Jesus' name. And now everybody said, Amen. Amen.